Budget, the government announced a package of tax reliefs for our world-leading creative industries worth a billion pounds over the next five years, including a 40% relief on business rates bills for eligible film studios in England and enhanced tax reliefs for visual effects. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for his answer. The UK's cultural offer, as we know, is world beating, particularly through the performing arts projecting UK soft power across the globe. Whilst welcoming the progressive tax breaks for our incredible film industry, it would appear that our far reaching high end television offer has been left behind in the recent budget. Does my right honourable friend have plans to uh, redress this deficit and ensure that the UK remains at the top of everybody's screens around the world? Well, no one knows more about high-end TV than my honourable friend, <laughs> and whoever said politics was show business for ugly people was absolutely wrong in his case. Um, but I will take away what he says and look at high-end TV um, as a potential future budget measure. Tim Farron. Mr Speaker, the, the, uh, the Chancellor will be aware of the award-winning film The Windermere Children, which talks about the legacy of those Jewish children who survived the death camps uh, in Central Europe and made a new life for themselves on the banks of Lake Windermere at Troutbeck Bridge. For the last several years, there has been an ongoing exhibition to their legacy at Windermere Library, and now we look to build a lasting memorial alongside a rebuilt lake school at Troutbeck Bridge. Would you be interested in meeting with the uh, families of the Windermere children and those behind the new build and the provision of a new uh, lasting memorial to those uh, their legacy yeah, yeah. at Windermere at some point in the foreseeable future? Yeah. Well, um, I have to say it's a very tempting offer. And um, I will certainly see if my diary permits me to do that. But it sounds... I haven't actually seen the film he talks about. I have seen a film on a Holocaust theme called Zone of Interest, which is a remarkable British-led uh, film, uh, which um, I thoroughly recommend him seeing. But I will certainly see if I can visit him in his constituency. Sean Moore. Number two, Mr Speaker. With permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to answer this with question number 24. The economy is beginning to turn a corner after a series of unprecedented shocks. Inflation has more than halved GDP grew in January, and the economy is on a path to long-term growth. John Morrow. Mr. Speaker, the economy has grown at a snail's pace under the Tories, but that snail is still 30% faster nationally than in the North East, despite our strengths in clean energy, manufacturing, science, health. On average, my constituents are £11,500 worse off than if the economy had grown at the same rate as under the Tories. So is it any wonder that the Public Accounts Committee found that there's no compelling evidence of levelling up? And isn't a vote for the Tories a vote for continued economic failure? Yeah. Chancellor? Um, well, it is not, because um, we've grown faster than uh, Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, Germany and multiple yeah. other countries yeah. since yeah. 2010. But with respect to the North East in particular, she's absolutely right to say our vision is to spread growth into every corner of the country. And that's why in the last three months alone, both the Prime Minister and I have been to the <laughs> Nissan factory in Sunderland to mark their decision to make two electric car models uh, in the UK. And just last week, we went to announce the opening of a new massive film studio in Sunderland, which will bring over 8,000 jobs to the North East. Clive Lewis. Thank you, Speaker. According to the NSE Grantham Research Institute, the government's current programme for investment to mitigate the worst effects of climate change will see the climate change damage to the UK still hit an uh, increase from 1.1% of GDP to 3.3 per cent by 2050 and then 7.4 per cent of GDP by the end of the century. Now, to put that into context, that's the entire social care budget for the United Kingdom, around about 25 billion. And the Climate Change Committee has said that the current approach to adaption falls far short of what is needed. So has the Treasury made any attempt to assess the cost to GDP, public finance and jobs of failing to invest for climate adaption? Well, we listen very carefully to what the Climate Change Committee says, and we are absolutely committed to net zero. In fact, it was a Conservative government that passed the law requiring uh, the government to be committed to net zero, and he will know that we have become just the first major industrialised country to have decarbonised by more than 50% since 1990. With respect to the costs, I would just say to him we are also mindful of the economic opportunities, which is why we are investing billions of pounds in our clean energy transformation. Over here. Uh, 
My right honourable friend will be aware that my constituency has Cambridge to the north with fantastic new industries, uh, Johnson, Matthey and Royston in my constituency at the forefront of hydrogen, pharma companies to the south, uh, and of course some of the, the best film studios uh, in the world in Hertfordshire. Is he consciously trying to back these successful industries for the future so that our children and grandchildren have fantastic opportunities for the future? Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend, and that is absolutely what we are trying to do. And film and TV is a very good example. It's really now become an offshoot of the technology industry, and films like Barbie that were filmed in Hertfordshire um, look all Californian sunshine, but actually uh, they can withstand the British rain because of the use of high-tech uh, devices that simulate uh, Californian sunshine, even in his constituency. But that is absolutely our plan, and we will stick with it. Jim Fuller. Speaker, in response to COVID, this government introduced the furlough scheme and delivered and funded the world's first vaccine. In response to the energy price spike, this government introduced comprehensive support for families. The OBR, so beloved of the shell of a Chancellor, in their long-range forecast from 25 to 28, showed GDP increasing every year, GDP per capita increasing every year, average earnings increasing every year in real terms, productivity increasing in real terms. So does the Chancellor agree with me that when the shadow Chancellor says we face a 1979 moment, she's right? A choice between the Labour Party still in hock to their union bosses and a Conservative Party committed to growth. I, I have really got, I've got nothing to add to his brilliant list of statistics except to quote another independent organisation, the International Monetary Fund, that says that in the next five years, this country under Conservative leadership will grow faster than France, Germany, Italy or Japan. Shadow yeah. Minister James Murray. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the British people are paying the price for 14 years of Conservative economic failure, with lower wages, higher taxes and public services on their knees. Time and again, the Conservatives hide behind international factors and take no responsibility for their failures. Yet figures from the OECD confirm that the UK is the only G7 advanced economy now in recession, and according to the IMF, our economy is forecast to have the second slowest growth in the G7 this year. So can the Chancellor tell us why is the UK so far behind other major economies under the Conservatives? Well, it isn't, because it's actually grown faster than France, Germany and a whole bunch of other countries. But I'm very glad, I'm very glad he mentioned 14 years. So let's look at what happened under 14 years of Labour in ah, Wales. Yeah. Unemployment higher, NHS waiting lists longer, school standards worse and growth lower. And what's their reaction to that terrible record? They just promoted the Economy Minister to First Minister. Yeah. Long, Phil. You're not going to be frightened. Number three, Mr Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> With your permission, Mr Speaker, I should like to answer this question together with questions 6 and 12. Thanks to the combined impact of both national insurance cuts and above inflation increases to thresholds since 2010, an average worker on £35,400 in 2024-25 will pay over £1,500 less in personal taxes than they otherwise would have done. These NICS cuts were possible due to the significant progress we have made in combating inflation. Bob Longfield. The Minister has to say, but doesn't he recognise the assessment of the OBR in relation to the interplay between the changes the Government have made on thresholds and national insurance contributions? The OBR conclude that for every 5p gain there is a 10p loss, particularly for those on lower wages per year. Does he accept the OBR assessment? Oh. Oh. Well, I'm sure if the honourable gentleman looks carefully, he'll say that the government has demonstrated its commitment to supporting the most vulnerable in society. He would have also heard my, right hon my honourable friend, the member for North East Bed Bedfordshire, explain the circumstances as to why it is that we have higher taxes than we would desire. If he is telling me now that Labour Party policy is to have changes on thresholds, perhaps that's a conversation he can have with the Shadow Minister, who can explain how she would pay for it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The OBR has said that this will be the worst parliament on record for living standards yep. and the only parliament on record where living standards have fallen. People are poorer 
after 14 years of this go government. And it doesn't need fiscal tweaks. This economy needs economic renewal. It needs to bring in investment on a major scale, and it needs a new age of education, training and employment in the real economy. My constituents in Liverpool Walton cannot afford to wait while the Tory party looks and hopes for polling changes and changing fortunes. Haven't we now reached the point where the best thing for the economy is a general election? Yeah. I completely disagree with the Honourable Gentleman's uh, explanation there. Not only will I repeat the comments about our constituents completely understand the difficult global circumstances with the pandemic and the cost of living challenges following the invasion of Ukraine. We have grown faster since 2010 than many other major economies, and the IMF forecasts that we will grow faster than Germany, France, Italy, and Japan. In the year to 20, uh, Q3 2023, real household disposable income per person was around £1,100 higher than the OBR expected in their spring budget 2023 forecast. We have turned corner, the best thing to do is stick with the Conservatives. Yeah. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister says uh, that the economy has turned a corner, but households on average will be £870 worse off under the Conservatives' tax plan, as well as seeing their costs up by £110 a week compared to before the last election. <coughs> is the Minister proud of his record? We are immensely proud of the record since 2010. Uh, living, living standards increased and growth better than many other major economies. And in terms of our absolute commitment to protecting the most vulnerable in society, we saw that recently. Of course, with the cost of living, an average support around £3,400 of support for households. We have turned a, conima, a, a, a corner and the economy is improving. I am just disappointed the opposition constantly talk the UK economy and their constituents down. Yeah. Steve Double. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can my honourable friend confirm that following the uh, 4p cut in national insurance that the Chancellor has introduced, that the tax take on workers is now the lowest it will be for 50 years, and that uh, people in St Alston Newquay, where they have two people in the household on average incomes, will be paying £1,800 less this coming year than they, done, than they did last year? Yes, absolutely. The honourable, my honourable friends pointed out a really, really important point on how we have had a laser focus on reducing uh, the tax rates, personal tax rates, and of course the measures as well announced in the autumn statement and in the spring budget will significantly add to economic activity, contributing uh, about 200,000 FTEs to the economy, and I'm sure the whole House would welcome that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And pensioners can often struggle because they have a fixed income. Therefore, I was pleased last year the Chancellor stuck with the triple lock, guaranteeing an increase of 10.1%. Can he explain, though, when it comes to this uh, payment, the 8.5% that people will be getting in a couple of weeks' time and how that will make a difference to people's living standards? Absolutely. Uh, and my right honourable uh, right friend is making an important point again. Not only have the measures we've announced in the autumn statement and the spring budget helped workers, we've also focused on helping pensioners. Uh, those on the new state pension will benefit to the tune of about £900 per year. That's a significant number because, of course, the national insurance cuts will benefit the average worker, 27 million employees, by £900 a year. So it's a fair and balanced budget and fair and balanced measures. Speaker, families in Stoke on Trent North, Kids Grevin Talk, were backed with this national insurance cut, meaning the average family would be eighteen hundred pounds a year better off. The freezing of the fuel duty means the motorists will be able to get round without being unfairly charged at the pump. Money from this government has meant that we've been able to cut bus fares in Stoke on Trent by a third so those can, people can travel round. We've had £56 million for the levelling up fund. We've had £17.6 million for the Kids Grove Town Deal, which means refurbish and reopen Kids Grove Sports Centre. The Labour Party closed because they couldn't be bothered to spend a pound to save it back in 2017, which means the health chances are also improved as well. Isn't the reality that we have a clear plan that is going to help the families of our great constituencies, particularly in Stoke on Trent, North Kids, Grimm, Talk, whilst Labour are going to borrow more, tax us higher, and lead us back into recession like they did back in the 08 09? Well, I couldn't agree with my honourable friend more. And it's fantastic. And I think this is a recurring pattern, Mr. Speaker. Positivity and optimism, confidence in the future of the UK economy from this time of the side of the chamber, absolute negativity on their side, because they have no plan, they have no clue, and they have no hope. We have a plan, and it's working. Shall the Minister Durham Jones? 
Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Why does the Treasury Minister think that people feel worse off after 14 years of the Conservatives in government? As I said, we are turning a corner and have therefore made measures to put money back into people's pockets. I don't think it will be a surprise to any of his constituents or indeed any uh, uh, Labour members uh, if they look at the record recently of the uh, Labour opposition, who claimed on the one hand they were supportive of tax cuts, but last week <coughs> failed to support those tax cuts when it came to, order to Parliament. Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Treasury Minister didn't answer the question about why the public feel worse off. I think on this side of the House we know why. And now he mentions tax cuts, but he doesn't talk about the freezing of tax thresholds or indeed the council tax that's about to be levied on people, not just in this year, but each year for the next five years. So why can't the Treasury Minister admit that for every 10 pence extra in the pound taken uh, from people since 2010, they're only now just giving back five pence? If I'm hearing co correctly, uh, the opposition front bench are announcing fundamental changes to policy which they have not yet costed. Uh, they, have not, they did not object, as far as I'm aware, to any of the measures that were required to support households and businesses during the pandemic, which necessitated increases in taxation. We are now reducing the level of taxation because we have turned a corner. They didn't support that. It's very interesting to hear one thing, and then when it comes to action, they do not take action. I, I think they need to explain to their constituents why they failed to support the tax cuts next, last week. Martin Day. Number four. Thank you. And with your permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to answer this question together with questions number 11 and 17. As a result of decisions at the spring budget, the Scottish Government is receiving around £295 million in additional funding in 2024-25 through the Barnet formula. Martin Day. Thank you. According to the Commons Library, this Government has cut the Scottish Government's capital funding by 16% in real terms from 2022-23 to 2024-25. The Institute of Fiscal Studies forecasts that there will be a further 16% cut by 2029. Wow. So after 14 years of austerity, inflation and COVID, can they tell me why the Chancellor is taking a hammer to our Scottish public services? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is aware that the, the block grant has been going up in real terms. He will also be aware that the, that the Scottish Government can switch resource to capital unlimited amounts if they choose to do so. He will also, I'm sure, be aware that the Scottish Government can borrow up to £400 million in capital each year if they so wish. Yeah. Did you the Tories have failed to invest in our public services yep. and high growth industries, dragging yep. the nations of the UK into recession and increased income equality. The UK government continues to impose hard cuts to public services, with the Commons Library finding that the Scottish Block Grant will in fact have fallen every year yep. in real terms since 2020, and yet UK government ministers continue to deny that fact. Firstly, does she understand what real terms actually means? <laughs> <laughs> and can she tell us? Um, can she tell us if she actually sees the devastating impact this is having on public services? Yeah. 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 Just to be absolutely clear, Mr. Speaker, the Scottish Government's TDL spending review settlement is growing in real terms over this Parliament by over one percent a year on average. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, she doesn't understand what real terms means, after all. Yeah. Analysis by the Institution of Civil Engineers shows that the multiplier effect for every pound spent the construction industry brings in an additional two pounds of spend. Ah. So this means that the real terms cut to the Scot Scottish Government's block gr uh, grant for capital by one point six billion over two years further deprives the economy of a wider three billion pound. Ah. So why does this government think it's okay to decimate infrastructure spend in Scotland? Because yeah. they don't. Mr Speaker, the Scottish Government is well funded to deliver its devolved responsibilities and receive 25 per cent more funding on average per person than the equivalent UK Government spending in other parts. That translates to £8.5 billion more a year on average. SNP spokesperson Drew Henry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Of course, consequentials have consequences. Yes. The Chancellor's budget announced £20 billion worth of cuts for the public server, some th service, some 13 per cent cuts for some depar departments, and that defies logic. The public sector is crying out for funding, yet his choices, if implemented, will lay waste to them. So, does the Minister agree with the IFS that said there would be, it would be genuinely surprising if his plans could be carried out, or the institutions? 
Institute for Government, these spending plans will be impossible to deliver, or the Resolution Foundation that said they were fiscal fantasy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, over the next Parliament, our plans are for spending to go up in real terms. I want to be absolutely clear about this. Equally, spending has gone up in real terms over this Parliament too. And he would have noticed at the beginning of this answer, I explained that you're getting £295 million extra this year through Barnet consequences. Drew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No wonder the Institute for Financial Studies say that there is a conspiracy of silence from both the Government and the Labour Party over the scale of these cuts. As a percentage of UK spending, the Scottish Block Grant is set to fall to its lowest ever level under devolution. Dwarfing is under other plans. For Scotland, the Commons Library figures show capital funding falling by 16% over the next two Real years. Terms. He's already confirmed that the Scottish energy sector is the biggest loser from his budget and is doubling down. Why is this government, why is this Chancellor trying to be the new hammer of Scots? Yeah. Yeah. The only area where I would agree with the honourable gentleman is I would love to know what the Labour Party spending plans are for the next Parliament, and perhaps they will enlighten us this evening. But um, I, I will repeat what I said at the beginning. On capital, you have unlimited ability to switch from resource spending <laughs> to capital spending. That is a choice that your Scottish Government has. I'm still calm. Uh, question five, Mr Speaker. Good morning, Mr Speaker. With permission, I'd like to answer this question together with question number 15. The Government continues to tackle regional economic inequalities and level up the United Kingdom. The Government is empowering local leaders through a range of devolution deals, regenerating places across the country and investing in vital infrastructure. Calm. Uh, Mr Speaker, in response to this month's budget, the director of IPPR North has said the budget is the government's admission that it has given up on levelling up this parliament, despite there being much left to do. Delivering on the government's levelling up commitments would mean my constituents would benefit from reduced social welfare dependency, increased earnings potential and improved health and well-being. So does the minister not think my constituents and all citizens outside of London and South East deserve the benefits that come with economic prosperity? Mr Speaker, we are committed and delivering on levelling up across the country. Medium pay growth has been higher in every region outside the London and South East under this government. And in his constituency, I can tell him that he's receiving £19 million from the levelling up uh, round one, £20 million levelling up round three. Uh, We've announced a Greater Manchester Trailblazer devolution deal and a Greater Manchester Investment Zone. This will bring more jobs and prosperity for all of his constituents. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've heard ministers this morning, and I must be living on an alternative universe. Liverpool has some of the most deprived wards in the country, experienced um, poverty and destitution in the last 14 years as a result of austerity. 300,000 have accessed the Household Support Fund, and while we are a resilient city, we will continue to support those households. So can the Minister explain what safety net will be put in place to support those in poverty and destitution when the Household Support Fund ends in six months' time? Well, she's right to highlight the fact that we've extended the Household Support Fund for the most vulnerable. This is on the back of £96 billion of support during the energy crisis, nearly £400 billion of support through the global pandemic. But I would just point out to her that the fundamental difference between this side and her side of the House is that we believe the best route out of poverty is through work, and this party is increasing employment. Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, across Cornwall and the Isle of Scilly, most jobs are supplied in supplied within very small businesses, many of them fall below the VAT threshold. And so in terms of economic inequalities around the region, uh, will the, the, welcome, uh, the increase to 90,000 for the VAT threshold is very welcome, but the threshold being that low and also the, the kind of cliff edge effect of going from zero to 20 per cent has a chilling impact on growing small businesses and providing all year round jobs. Will the minister consider addressing some sort of taper to the 90,000, but also increasing that further to maybe go in the region of 120,000 or so, that threshold. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Well, Mr. Speaker is right. We increased the VAT threshold uh, for small businesses. This will affect and impact and benefit 28,000 businesses across the country. We feel that the £90,000 threshold strikes the right balance uh, between managing public uh, finances sustainably as well as supporting businesses. But we keep these things under review, as he knows. Stephen Crow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The port of Milford Haven in my constituency has been right out in front, taking the lead in investing in and showing how decarbonisation can boost the economy of Wales and reduce inequality. Yesterday, they were told that their bid to the government's Flomis port funding scheme had been rejected out of hand. So, could I ask my right honourable friend whether he would ask his good friend, the Chancellor of Exchequer, to meet with me to talk about the important work being done at at the UK's leading oil and gas port and how the UK government can support those efforts financially. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, Flomes is an incredibly important scheme for improving and enhancing our ability uh, to expand floating offshore uh, wind. We are a huge supporter of his constituents and uh, the whole of Wales. If the Chancellor cannot meet with him, I would be very happy to do so. Colm Good morning, just, Mr Speaker, and thank you. Question seven. <laughs> 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 uh, the Government, Mr Speaker, will raise the point at which child benefit is fully withdrawn to £80,000 from £60,000 and will raise the high income child benefit charge threshold to £60,000 up from £50,000 from the 6th of April 2024, taking 170,000 families out of paying the charge. Overall, Mr Speaker, these changes mean almost half a million hard-working families will gain an average of £1,260 towards the cost of raising their children. Call the cop. Thank you and good afternoon, Speaker. <laughs> these changes are welcome and mean that more Lincoln families will receive more support from governments, as I told the Minister in Lincoln on Friday. Can my honourable friend confirm when the formal consultation on basing child benefit on household income rather than individual income will commence if the civil servants in the Treasury will let him? Well, I thank my honourable friend. It was a pleasure, as always, to meet him in his constituency on Friday, where we discussed this matter and indeed many others. The Government will launch a consultation in due course on how to end this unfairness by administering the HICBIC on a household rather than individual basis. Doing so, of course, would require significant reform to the tax system, as our tax infrastructure does not currently have a mechanism to consider household income. But the Government plans to end the unfairness for single earner families in the child benefit system by administering the HIPVIC on a household rather than individual basis by April 2026. Jim Chin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for that? M Minister, child benefit income is an integral part of how families judge and make their monies last through the whole week. So if there are going to be any changes which will reduce that in any way, uh, is it the Minister's intention to ensure that those who have <coughs> questions or difficulties or, or uh, have some concerns that their concerns and their uh, wishes will be taken on board. It is really important that those who are going to find financial changes can, can cope with the, the changes that come. Hey, hey. Yes, I, I thank the honourable gentleman. And uh, because of the complexities involved, uh, um, of course, that is precisely why we will be having the uh, consultation. And I am sure his views and those of his constituents will be warmly welcomed in that. Thanks. Number eight, please, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, autumn statement 2023, the Chancellor set out ambitious growth packages uh, designed to boost business investment. This includes making full expensing uh, permanent a tax cut uh, to companies of over £10 billion a year to ensure we're one of the most generous capital allowances in the world. We, uh, with further growth enhancing measures set out in the spring budget 2024, the OBR estimates that government policy announced at the past three fiscal events is expected to increase the size of the economy by 0.7 per cent by 2028 29. Sam Bench. Like my honourable friend, the member for St Ives, I too was delighted to see the increase in the VAT threshold from £85,000 to £90,000 in the budget, which will help small businesses. Um, invest for the future, like the Two Doves Cafe and Gift Shop in Overton, which is popular with both people from Cluid South and North Shropshire. But given the vital importance to small businesses, would my, right, would my honourable friend prioritise increasing the VAT threshold again in the next fiscal intervention? Well, my honourable friend comes to this house with significant business experience, so when he 
talks, uh, we certainly listen, and I'm delighted to hear that he was pleased with the VAT increase, uh, the threshold increase. I can tell him that, uh, in addition to what I said to our, uh, our honourable friend about the £90,000 uh, threshold, it is at this level uh, higher than any EU member state and the joint highest in the OECD, and many of his businesses will be one of the part of the 28,000 that will benefit from this uh, increase, so we have no plans at this stage to change it. Andrew Gwynne. Thank you. But the actual record of this government over the past 14 years is abysmal. It is a fact that business investment has been consistently amongst the lowest in both the OECD and the G7, and now the Office of Budget Responsibility is forecasting a further 5% fall this year. Why? Uh, Mr Speaker, if you look at the facts of what we are announcing as part of every fiscal event that are going back the last three, we are enhancing our business environment, our business investment uh, environment for international investors. If you look at FDI stock, we are the second highest FDI stock in the world. We have some of the best universities in the world which are attracting uh, businesses. We have announced full expensing, uh, which is a £10 billion a year uh, tax cut. We have the lowest corporation tax in the G7. We are reforming our energy grid, which is bringing investment into our net zero ambitions. We are reforming our systems, reducing our taxes, and encouraging investment. Number nine, please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognise it has been a very challenging time for Safe Hands customers. The Honourable Member will be aware that the FCA, as the independent regulator of the funeral plans sector, is responsible for dealing with specific cases. However, the Treasury and the FCA have worked very closely throughout the process of bringing the sector into regulation, as well as during the implementation of the new regulatory framework. Mr Speaker, my experience of the FCA and the Safe Hands funeral plan fiasco is that they took six months to reply to my FOI request and pleaded commercial confidentiality to key questions. And despite being warned, the Treasury failed to support customers, consumers moving from an unregulated sector into regulation. It appears to me that the Treasury missed opportunities to support <coughs> consumers and is still shuffling its feet. Mr Speaker, at least 47,000 people are out of pocket to the tune of £60 million. They were trying to protect their loved ones from expensive funerals at the worst of times. So, will the Minister now consider, consider an independent review of this matter? A constructive response is needed to ensure that safe hands victims can have confidence in a system which for too long has let them down. I share the Honourable Member's anger at how safe hand customers have been treated. The organisation, the business, is under criminal investigation by the Serious Fraud Office, and their administrators are bringing legal action against the former owner of the safe hands business. Now, in the Treasury, we do not believe that it's right to use taxpayer money to compensate consumers who lose out due to the conduct of unregulated firms. They were not within the regulatory perimeter at that time. Now, we've worked with the sector so that the two largest providers of funeral plans have agreed to provide significantly discounted replacement plans for the customers that have found themselves so badly treated. Chris Stevens. Ten, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The rise of inflation caused by Putin's illegal war in Ukraine and subsequent energy price shock has put enormous pressure on households. Thanks to the work from the Bank of England and the government, the rate of inflation, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, is going down, with the OBR expecting it to be back to target next quarter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But since the disastrous Tony mini budget of 2022, households are continuing to feel the squeeze and at the supermarket with food prices continuing to rise and real wages falling for the longest unbroken run since records began. Food prices have now risen by 26 per cent over the last two years. So when will the government listen to those of us who wish to follow Canada and France's lead to introduce a price cap on staple food items at the supermarket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mr Speaker, real wages are now happily starting to rise. As I said, the ABAR has said that inflation will be back uh, to target next quarter. And I tell you, Mr Speaker, what will not help with the cost of living is putting people's taxes up, as they are doing in the Scottish Government. Yeah. Mr Tulips. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The tax burden is at a record high. Wages are stagnant. Rents and mortgages are up by hundreds of pounds, and food prices have gone up by 25 per cent. The Resolution Foundation has confirmed this is the only parliament on record when living standards have fallen. Mr Speaker, our constituents deserve better. So could I ask the Minister, when is she going to give the British public a chance to vote for change and call for a general election? Mr Speaker, we have talked a lot today about the £400 billion of support that we put in during the pandemic, the £100 billion of support that we put in to support people during Putin's energy price shock. The Labour Party did not disagree with any of these things, and I think the Honourable Lady in her heart of hearts will know that we have to pay for that. At least I hope she does. We have had to take some difficult decisions, but because, but because of that, the economy is turning a corner. We are able to reduce working people's taxes, and I hope that the Honourable Lady will bring it to in herself for and her party to actually support us in that endeavour. Dr James Dent. Number 13, Mr Speaker. With permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to answer this question together with questions 16 and 18. Small businesses drive our economy and we support them to thrive using levers across this government, whether it's through our small business rates relief by increasing the VAT registration threshold, providing relief such as the annual investment allowance, or through various programmes offered by the British Business Bank. Dr. James Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Welsh Government is increasing the burden on small businesses <coughs> by reducing retail hospitality and leisure business rates relief from 75% to just 40%, wow. despite the UK Government rightly extending this relief in England in the budget. And that means that businesses in my constituency, such as the Little Cheesemonger, Now to Bed, Presence with a Difference, and Two Mundo, are all facing unsustainable business rates bills, with one business having to find an extra £35,000 a year for business rates alone. So what advice does the Minister have for small businesses in North Wales facing these onerous bills? Mr Speaker, my own friend is right that at the autumn statement this uh, government extended the retail hospitality and leisure relief in England, a tax cut worth 2.5 billion pounds for small businesses. I can tell him that the Barnet formula applies to allow the Welsh uh, Labour government to offer similar re relief if they want to, but it is disappointing, if not surprising, that when given the opportunity, Labour decide not to tax, uh, cut taxes for working people. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my honourable friend agree with me that one of the best steps the government can take to support small businesses in Eastley, Hedge End and Botley is, a, is, a pack is through a package of business rate reductions? And will he outline to the House the progress the government has made in this regard where desperately needed? Uh, well, my honourable friend is right. Business rate uh, relief is a great way to support small businesses in Eastleigh and across the country. Our small business uh, rate relief means that one third of all properties in England already pay no uh, business rates at all. We've frozen the small business multiplier, protecting over one million properties from a multiplier increase. And as I was just saying, we're supporting high streets with our retail, hospitality and leisure relief. Blake Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Oh, just after the budget, I met with some of my small businesses at the Flower Pots in Cheriton. Well, they were pleased with some of the budget. They talked about improving productivity and growth by raising the VAT threshold far beyond the 90,000 possibly to 250,000, which they felt would incentivise sole traders and small businesses to expand and work longer hours. They feel at present growth is restricted because of the level of the VAT threshold. Has the Chancellor given any thought to increasing the threshold to improve productivity? Well, Mr Speaker, um, my old friend is right to engage in the way that she is with her uh, small businesses. I can tell her that we believe the £90,000 threshold, which has just been increased, uh, strikes the right balance between managing public finances and supporting uh, small businesses. But I would just encourage her to look at the wider package of support that this government is providing for small businesses, not least uh, the business rates relief that I was just talking about. Gregory Campbell. 
Oh, so Speaker, will the Minister have discussions with his counterparts in the devolved institutions to ensure that the likes of sole traders and small businesses see a reduction in bureaucracy to make them more profitable, offering more business opportunities to more people across the United Kingdom? Mr Speaker, I can assure him that this Government does engage very frequently with uh, our counterparts in the Northern Ireland uh, Administration. That will continue to be the case. Thank you, Mr Speaker. According to the Federation of Small Businesses, two in three small businesses are suffering with late payments. This is 14 years on now of a, of a Tory Government. Uh, why don't the Government follow Labour's lead and actually strengthen the law on this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we are acutely aware of this issue. I have myself had meetings with the FSB, and that is why the Chancellor has announced uh, plans to improve the situation for small businesses. And I am very happy to outline that in writing to him. Other One of the requests from uh, women female-led businesses in my constituency, including Carlock and Rock and Rollers, was for a VAT cut for hairdressing businesses. Can you tell me why that wasn't considered uh, in the budget? Because these businesses are an important part of our high street and quite often led, up, led by women who have, off, who, have, who have missed out significantly in the Chancellor's budget. Speaker, um, we of course support uh, hairdressers, we support our high street, we support women run businesses. That's why we've uh, extended the retail hospitality and leisure relief to 75%, uh, cutting taxes for hardworking people. That is what the Conservative government does. Morgan. Number 14, please, Mr. Speaker. The Government has nearly doubled the personal allowance since 2010, and in 2024-25 it will be over 20% um, higher in real terms than it would have been if uprated by inflation since 2010-2011. The personal allowance is currently set at a level high enough to ensure that pensioners, whose sole income is the full rate of the new state pension or the basic rate pension, do not pay any income tax. Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I've been contacted by pensioners in my constituency who get a full state pay pension plus protected payments from the old scheme, and that has placed them over the threshold for paying income tax. Yep. So the increase in their pension in line with inflation has been eaten away by being drawn into the personal allowance uh, threshold. Was it the Minister's intention that pensioners would be dragged into paying income tax in his budget? Well, as I outlined previously, uh, and the Resolution Foundation and others have pointed out, that pensioners have in fact gained about £1,000 on average as a result of the Government's decision since 2010 to increase thresholds. Some pensions, of course, rely solely on the State for their incomes, and we are supporting pensioners for a variety of other measures, and of course not only the triple lock, but pension credit and cost of living support. And pensioners across the country will benefit from this 8.5% increase which is coming in April. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the re recent tax cuts. Now, we need to ensure that those who work hard, do the right thing, are rewarded in their old age. Minister, can the Treasury please stop allocating funds to France, who are clearly not stopping the boats, and stop extortionate amounts being spent on hotels for illegal migrants and reduce the foreign aid budget? Then maybe we can give even more to our pensioners. Yes, well, the Honourable Lady will be well aware that on this side of the House we are doing and implementing measures to tackle the very problems that she has outlined, whilst also turning the corner in the economy and doing everything we can to put more money back in people's pockets, whether that's workers or pensioners. Speaker, last week the OBR told the Treasury Select Committee. 20, number 20, sorry. Mr Speaker, as set out at spring budget, we are considering the findings of the Office of Budget Responsibilities Review of the original costing of the withdrawal of tax-free shopping, alongside industry representations and broader data. The Government welcomes further submissions from stakeholders in response to the OBR's finding as we keep all taxes under review. Last week, the OBR informed the Treasury Select Committee that it has not assessed the Treasury's forecast that it will cost £900 million to extend tax-free shopping to EU visitors. The OBR has also failed to support the Treasury's assumption that EU visitor behaviour and costs can be extrapolated from assessed EU data. Non, sorry, non-EU data. The UK retail industry firmly believes it will cost as little as £50 million to reintroduce VAT uh, tax-free shopping uh, for tourists. As we mark England, English Tourism Week, isn't it time we had a full 
independent review of the Treasury's data on tax-free shopping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I thank my honourable friend's consistent championing of tourism, and in particular yeah, during, yeah. during English Tourism Week? Um, it's actually not within the OBR's remit to consider the effect of alternative policies, um, and as expanding tax-free shopping to EU visitors is not current government policy, they have not therefore considered that. But the findings of the review will be very useful insights into the overall behavioural incentives of the policy, which will be, will be relevant for both EU and non-EU populations. Um, it is therefore right that the Government takes time to consider the OBR's findings, along with other representations, and of course within the context of this broader data, um, as was announced in the uh, Budget. Topical, Andrew Bridget. Topical 1, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I would like to update the House on living standards in the UK. The most recent data suggests that despite a tough couple of years caused by the pandemic and energy crisis, living standards will return to their pre-COVID peak next year, a full two years earlier than originally predicted by the OBR. They have risen by £1,700 a household in real terms since 2010. And this year's cut in national insurance will increase living standards by 1%. In other words, to coin a phrase, now is not the time to go back to square one. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that the Prime Minister was, has been forced to abandon his plans for an election on May the 2nd and, and could soon be facing a, a uh, leadership challenge, does the Chancellor of the Exchequer believe that his budget landed well with the public or even landed well with his colleagues on the government benches? Uh, well, what I would say to the honourable gentleman who used to be an honourable friend is the, very simply that that budget will mean the UK economy will grow faster than France, Germany, Italy or Japan in the next five years, and that is doing the right thing for the country. Yeah. Yeah. And the thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I would like to thank the Minister for the opportunity to meet UK Finance yesterday, who told me and other MPs that the industry plans to roll out 225 banking hubs in the next 18 months. Given that in my constituency we have lost every single bank branch over the last few years, could the Minister tell me or could he help me to make sure in Leon C, where we have 250 retailers, we get one of those 225 banking hubs? I thank uh, my, uh, my honourable friend. And it was, um, it's first of all important to note her consistent championing of this issue for her constituents, for which she deserves a huge commendation. Uh, in relation to the precise point that she mentions, it's important that the government doesn't decide about bank branches or banking hubs, but the industry does. But she has made her case very ably. I urge her to work with Cash, Cash Access UK and Link to make sure that she has the best chance of securing one of those new 225 banking hubs, as the industry has outlined, uh, in her constituency. We come to shut the chance of the Exchequer, Rachel yeah. Reeves. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After the budget, the Chancellor wrote to Conservative Party members telling them that the government planned to abolish national insurance. The Economic Secretary said that national insurance will vanish, and the Prime Minister said that it was his ambition to abolish it. So can the Chancellor confirm whether he asked the Office for Budget Responsibility to cost the government's unfunded plan to abolish national insurance contributions? Well, I'm very glad that she asked about national insurance cuts because at first she supported them, uh, then she abstained in the lobbies, now she appears to be against them, like the banker's bonus tax, which she was strongly in favour of and then strongly against, like £28 billion of borrowing, which she was strongly in favour of and then strongly against. Isn't the actual truth here that where Labour should have an economic policy, there is just a black hole filled with platitudes? Yeah. The Chancellor did not even attempt to answer the question, but the Chair of the OBR told the Treasury Committee the week after the Budget that it was not a measure given to us to cost. Even the Chancellor's predecessor, who was sacked for his own kamikaze budget, said, and I quote, if you're going to reduce taxes, you have to show at least partially where the money is going to come from. So can I ask the Chancellor, where will the money come from? Will it come from cuts to the NHS, the state pension and public services? Will it come from increasing taxes, including for pensioners, or will it come from increasing borrowing? Which one, Chancellor? 
Mr Speaker, even Torsten Bell from the Left Leaning Resolution Foundation said her argument that this was a mini budget style black hole was nonsense because we specifically ah. said we wouldn't fund national insurance cuts from increasing borrowing or cutting spending on public services. But can I gently say to her that if she wants to put on the mantle of fiscal rectitude, where is Labour going to find literally billions of pounds to fund unfunded spending pledges from grid decarbonisation to NHS waiting lists? We all know what that will lead to higher taxes like every Labour government in history. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, topic number four. Um, St Mary's Paddington is a much loved and much used hospital in my constituency. And although it was taken off the uh, 14 new hospital to be redeveloped, I am delighted to be working with the honourable member, honourable friend for Kensington, and the hospital minister in the Lords to make the case with the trust to ensure that it does get redeveloped. Could therefore the chief secretary to the treasury please update the house on the time frame for government funding to, to, to be made, made available so that we can do the planning uh, business case for the redevelopment? I commend my honourable friend and the honourable member for Kensington for their great work on this project. This appears to be a very compelling case, and I know the DHSC programme team are looking closely at this proposal right now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Fife Whisky Festival took place in Cooper earlier this month and it was a great success. Yeah, yeah. The industry welcomes the freeze in alcohol duty but notes it's only for six months. When will the government provide the longer term consistency that the industry needs? Well, Mr Speaker, our support for the Scottish Whisky Association, by the way, it was a pleasure to meet with them recently, is long standing. If you look back at a series of fiscal uh, events uh, going back many years, we've either frozen or cut duty for Scottish whisky. We're representing the Scottish Whisky Association in trade agreements, and that support will endure long into the future. Jill Mortimer. In response to the spring budget, I've heard from constituents who feel they may have been forgotten. Now, I know that um, under Conservatives, the number of pensioners living in absolute poverty has been slashed by 200,000 across the country, and we have protected um, the triple lock. But please, can my right honourable friend remind me of all the steps his department is taking to support Hartlepool's pensioners so that at the weekend, when I'm on the doorsteps, I can tell them? Absolutely delighted to do that. And uh, the Independent Resolution Foundation said that because of measures this government has taken, pensioners are a thousand pounds better off in real terms than 2010. But what did we do in the budget specifically? Uh, we did two things. We put £6 billion into the NHS, which is used more by pensioners than anyone else. And secondly, by backing workers' tax cuts. We are supporting growth in the economy, which means yeah. we can continue to fund the triple lock for many years to come. Bob yeah. Longfield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of my constituents wrote to me last week about her son, Fred. Fred has Down syndrome and severe learning disabilities. He's profoundly deaf and he has an autism diagnosis. His parents and grandparents did the right thing and put money into a child trust fund for him. Now, Fred will be 18 next month but he lacks the capacity to access his money and there's no easy way for his parents to do it. So will the Chancellor work with colleagues in DWP and MOJ to unlock the money for Fred and an estimated 80,000 other disabled young people? Yeah, 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 yeah. I thank the Honourable Member for that question. I'm happy to meet with him to discuss the precise circumstances of his constituents' case, but to say in general terms that it is a priority for us to make sure that people get access to that money if it's due to them. Chair of the Select Committee, Harriet Morley. Speaker, did the Chancellor see that uh, in uh, uh, an article yesterday, the independent director of the Institute for Physical Studies confirmed that the average earner in the UK now has the lowest effective personal tax rate since 1975, one that's lower than in America, France, Germany or any G7 country, and that someone on 35,000 today, the average earnings for those working full-time, faces an income tax and national insurance bill getting on for £2,000 lower than uh, someone would have had on the same real earnings back in 2010. And does he agree that unfunded spending plans, uh, now that he's changed the rules in terms of residence and domicile, uh, by the party opposite, could lead to or, 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 higher or, or, taxes or, 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 for those people? Can, can I just say it's top of the list? I do want to get the other members who've now had a chance. 
Thank you. Look, I thank my honourable friend for her excellent question. And she is right that it's not just the lowest effective tax rate for someone on average earnings since 1975. It's the lowest headline tax rate. It's the lowest tax rate in the G7. And that is the fundamental divide in British politics. Taxes have gone up on this side of the House. We don't think we have to accept the status quo. On that side of the House, they do. And why is that? Because lower taxes mean higher growth. Yes. Yes. Indeed, Mr Speaker. Well, a recent survey from the Debt Justice Campaign has shown that 13 per cent of adults have missed three or more bill or credit uh, payments in the last six months, and that 6.7 million people are now in financial difficulty. So does the Chancellor accept that for millions of people, getting from one end of the month to the next under the Tories is an absolute nightmarish struggle, and that people are feeling worse off because they actually are worse off? Well, um, let me, if I may, uh, gently correct her because uh, living standards have risen by, as I said earlier, by £1,700 per household since 2010, and the number of people in absolute poverty is down by 1.7 million. But she is right to talk about the pressures facing people on debt, and that's why in the budget we abolished the £90 fee for debt relief yeah. orders, having talked yeah. to the citizens' advice bureau. Proposed changes to wine duty will add huge cost and complexity to business. Yeah. Further to my Westminster Hall debate, will my right honourable friend meet with me and wine businesses to hear their concerns and make the easement that's due to end on the 1st of February next year permanent? Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is talking about the largest and most significant reform of our alcohol duty system in 140 years, making it more simple by saying the stronger the ABV, the more duty you pay. We introduced the wine easement uh, to give the wine industry two years to prepare for those changes. I continue to engage with the industry and I will continue to engage with my own friend. Sir, oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two years ago, P&O Ferry sacked 786 workers and replaced them with agency staff paid less than the minimum wage. After this fiasco, the government promised to review all contracts with this company. Why is it then that since this, the government has spent £900,000 directly with P&O ferries. Why are the Conservatives so comfortable spending taxpayers' money of rewarding appalling treatment of working people? Yeah. Yeah. Let me say to the Honourable Lady, who I very much enjoy working with on the Select Committee, that our record is of 800 more people in work for every single day of Conservative government since yeah. 2010. And the thing that will wreck that is Labour's New Deal for Workers, which the President of the CBI will says will destroy the job-creating machine that the UK has become. Yeah. Mr Speaker, thank you. Could I please commend the Treasury for good fiscal policies that have resulted in inflation falling significantly <laughs> since the pandemic? Could I also perhaps ask the Chancellor when we might see a commensurate fall in interest rates? Um, well, I'm very sorry to disappoint my honourable friend, but uh, chancellors never comment on decisions made by the Bank of England on interest rates. But what I can say is that the Office for Budget Responsibility predicted at the budget that inflation would fall to a round target in the next few months, and that gives the best possible prospect of interest rates starting to fall. Yeah. Yes, Brendan Martin. Last night on BBC News night, it was clear that the needs of Wales, particularly in health, are not met in the UK. So when has the UK government given England Barnet consequentials based on needs in Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland? Surely the model for spending, of spending where the government in England decides for England and everyone else gets a consequential of that must end. For instance, in Nordic countries, they don't spend as a percentage of their neighbours. Why is the spending of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland depending on what England decides to spend? Mr Speaker, the Barnard Consequentials Formula is long established. It gives a clear framework in which we can, we can understand spending in the devolved nations. He will also know that this means higher per person funding in each of the devolved nations than in England. Oh, well that my right honourable friend the Chancellor is seeking to make the tax system more family friendly, including collecting household data in the years ahead. But being family friendly includes looking after the family home. Sweden abolished inheritance tax in 2004. The result was a boom in entrepreneurship, economic growth and higher tax revenues. So will he or one of the uh, excellent ministerial team meet me to discuss this further? 
Can I, can I thank uh, my right honourable friend's uh, advocacy uh, for support for families because we had conversations and I know he very much welcomes the changes to HIPBIC and child benefit. Of course, we always keep taxes under review and I'm always delighted to meet my right honourable friend. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Chancellor uh, accept that he's caused a great deal of anxiety and further distrust by those um, who've been infected and affected by the contaminated blood scandal by not making any provision in his budget for compensation when we know the recommendations were made to Government last April for compensation to be paid? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I gently say to her that I stand by every word that I said when I gave evidence twice to the infected blood inquiry. Uh, the government has an absolute moral responsibility not just to pay the compensation owed, but to pay it as speedily as possible. Mr. Speaker, I join the Economic Secretary uh, with my honourable friend for South and West uh, to discuss closures of banks, and in particular, Barclays Bank are both shameful and shameless when it comes to this. Would my, right, would my honourable friend agree with me that we need full transparency in the decisions being made, including that of Link and the Financial Conduct Authority, when they were reviewing these? But also, one thing we found yesterday, Mr. Speaker, which may be of interest to those in Chorley, is that currently the criteria only consider the town plus one kilometre circumference. That is not how the rural economy works. And would he work with me to make sure that we take wider economy into account when considering this? I thank my right honourable friend for that question, and again, she's another good example of an excellent champion for her constituents on this issue and so many others. In relation to the precise point she makes, that she pointed out, it's right for the industry uh, to work out how it's going to increase provision. Uh, adapt the criteria for rural areas, and I'll work with her on that to make sure that the banking hubs are rolled out in an equitable way to rural areas as well as more urban ones. We now come to the urgent question, but I'll let the front benches clear. We now come to the urgent question. I call the Shadow Secretary of State, David Lammy, yeah. to ask the Secretary of State if he will make a statement on the situation in Gaza and Israel. Minister. Uh, can I uh, thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his urgent question? Uh, Mr. Speaker, Israel suffered the worst terrorist attack in its history on the 7th of October last year. The scenes we saw on that day were appalling, and Hamas's disregard for civilian welfare continues today, over five months later. We remember uh, those all the time still being held hostage and their families, and we call once again for their immediate release. However, we of course remain deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza and the impact of the conflict on all Palestinian civilians. We have borne witness, Mr Speaker, to death and displacement on a vast scale. Over 1,700,000 people have had, the, had to leave their homes, many on multiple occasions. We are deeply concerned about the growing risk of famine exacerbated by the spread of disease and, of course, the terrible psycho psychosocial impacts of the conflict that will be felt for years to come. We are totally committed to getting humanitarian aid to all the people in Gaza who desperately need it, either ourselves or through UN agencies and British or other charities. We and our partners are pushing to get aid in through all feasible means, by land, sea and air. We have trebled our aid funding to the OPTs this year, Mr Speaker, providing just under £100 million, pounds, of which £70 million has been delivered as humanitarian assistance. 150 tonnes more of UK aid arrived in Gaza on the 13th of March, including 840 family tents, 13,440 blankets, almost 3,000 shelter kits and shelter fixing kits, 6,000 sleeping mats and more than 3,000 dignity kits. 
A field hospital provided by UK aid funding to UK Med arrived in Gaza from Manchester last Friday. This facility, staffed by UK and local medics, will be able to treat over 100 patients a day. Along with Cyprus, the US, UAE and others, Britain will help deliver humanitarian aid by sea to a new temporary US military pier in Gaza via a maritime corridor from Cyprus. But we have been clear that air and sea deliveries cannot substitute delivery of aid through land routes. Only through land routes can the volume of aid now be required to be met. We continue to press Israel to open more land crossings for longer and with fewer screening requirements. There is no doubt that land crossings are the most effective means of getting aid into Gaza, and Israel must do more. There is also no doubt that the best way to bring an end to the suffering is to agree an immediate humanitarian pause and progress towards a sustainable permanent ceasefire without a return to destruction, fighting and loss of life. Getting to this outcome is the focus of all our diplomatic efforts right now, Mr Speaker, and a goal that is shared by our international partners. We urge all sides to seize the opportunity and continue negotiations to reach an agreement as soon as possible. David Lamy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, a UN BAT report revealed the shocking reality that famine in Gaza is imminent. Half the population is expected to face catastrophic levels of hunger, the highest number of people ever recorded under this system. Only twice in 20 years have famine conditions been reached. But what distinguishes the horror in Gaza from what has come before is that this is not driven by drought or natural disaster. It is man-made. It is the consequences of war. It is the consequence of aid that is available not reaching those who need it. Food is piled up in trucks just a few kilometres away, while children in Gaza are starving. It's unbearable, and it must not go on. (coughs) International law is clear. Israel has an obligation to ensure the provision of aid. The binding measures ordered by the ICJ require this. The world has demanded it for months, yet still aid flows are woefully inadequate. Mm -hmm. Aid actually fell by half between uh, between January and February. This is outrageous. The continued restrictions on aid flows are completely unacceptable. It must stop now. Just as Hamas must release the hostages now. I don't doubt that the Minister agrees with me, but will he have the courage to say that the ICJ's orders, including on aid, are binding and that Israel must comply with them? And does the FCDO's lawyers believe Israel is in compliance currently with its obligations? Amid this accelerating hunger crisis, Prime Minister Netanyahu reportedly approved plans for an offensive against Rafa. This would risk catastrophic humanitarian consequences. It would be a disaster for civilians and a strategic mistake. How is the government working to prevent a further attack on Rafa? The truth is this. If it isn't possible to address the crisis in Gaza, Uh, It won't be possible to address the crisis in Gaza if the fighting doesn't stop. And that is also the best way to secure the release of hostages. So will the government finally now join with us and dozens of countries and call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire? Well, I thank the honourable gentleman for his uh, questions and his comments. And let me try and deal with them uh, more or less sequentially. Uh, First of all, he asked me about the reports of famine, and the IPC report uh, is clear. It says, and I quote, famine is a very real scenario, and we are doing everything we can, as I set out in my first response, to try and head that off. There is also, in addition to famine, the danger of 
disease, the lack of health services, the acute danger from the lack of clean water and effective uh, sanitation. So, so we are doing everything we can to head off the appalling circumstances which he set out. He asks me also about the number of trucks. Uh, I can tell him that on Sunday 192 trucks did get in, but that is woefully short of what is required. It is more than got in in March, which averaged 165 so far, and in February it was only 1997. But he will be well aware that before the crisis, uh, more than 500 trucks a day were getting in. He asked me about uh, the ICJ. As everyone in the House will know, the ICJ uh, judgment is binding. Uh, and in respect of the offensive against Rafa, the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister, uh, and indeed all our allies, have consistently warned that an offensive against Rafa at this time would have the most appalling humanitarian uh, uh, con uh, consequences. Uh, so uh, may I finish by taking the point that he made again about a ceasefire. As far as I'm aware, the position of the Labour front bench is still the same as the position of the government, that we are calling for, we are calling for an immediate pause so that we can get the hostages out. So, so, Mr Speaker, that we can get the hostages out and aid in followed, we hope, by a sustainable ceasefire. And it is that, Mr Speaker, that we are working towards. Yeah. Chair of the Select Committee, Alicia Khan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by putting on record my gratitude for the Minister for Middle East, who made significant representations ahead of Ramadan to reduce tensions in Jerusalem and particular access to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which so far remains calm. The IPC report does make breathtakingly difficult reading, and the humanitarian situation is catastrophic but it need not be. So can I ask that we please push harder on the Jordan land truck entry and make sure that is fully operationalised? And can my right honourable friend tell me when the House will be formally updated on whether Israel is demonstrating a commitment to international humanitarian law? Well, I thank her for her uh, comments, and I will pass on her comments about my colleague, uh, Lord Ahmed, uh, the Minister for the uh, Middle East. In respect of international humanitarian law, we are going through the necessary legal processes, which are complex, but I can tell her that as soon as we are in a position to update the House on what we have set out clearly before, uh, we will do so. Spokesperson Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I take absolutely no satisfaction in saying that a month ago in this chamber I said that innocent people will die because of Israel's decision to prevent food getting to those who need it. So these reports of an Im imminent famine should surprise no one. We've all known that this deliberate man-made famine was coming. Yeah. I've just returned from Al Arish on the Egyptian Gaza border with the Foreign Affairs Committee where we saw hundreds and hundreds of lorry loads of food and aid waiting for permission to get into Gaza. So let's be very clear about our language here. The people of Gaza are not starving. The people of Gaza are being starved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And does the minister accept that there is no food shortage in the region? Does he accept that the reason that people are starving to death just 44 miles from Tel Aviv, the distance between Glasgow and Edinburgh, is as a direct result of the Israeli siege and the premeditated decision yeah. to cut off food supplies? Yeah, yeah, and does he yeah. also accept that starving a civilian population to death is a war crime. Here, here, here. And finally, does he still believe that the UK is right, both legally and morally, to continue se selling weapons to Israel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, on his uh, final point, Mr Speaker, he is well aware of the arms sale regime that Britain adopts. And uh, as I have said to him uh, before, from this dispatch box, it is the toughest uh, anywhere in the world. I think, Mr. Speaker, I think, Mr. Speaker, the, the 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 difference, if I may say so, between him and me is that uh, as we he sees things as we would wish them to be, but uh, we in government have to deal with them as they are. 
And that is why we are taking so many steps to try and achieve the release of the hostages and to get aid and support uh, into uh, Gaza. And, and to, one, to one point that uh, he makes where he is right, and it's a point also echoed by the shadow foreign secretary, and it is this. The way to get aid into Gaza is by road and by truck. Of course, we are doing everything we can to explore every way, including the maritime route and dropping aid, and dropping aid from the air. But at the end of the day, it is through road traffic, and that's one of the reasons why we are uh, working so closely with Jordan to ensure that that route of aid in by road is enhanced. But at the end of the day, it, that is the right route to get aid in, and we are doing everything we can to try and make sure that it is pursued. Shalom Bahil. I asked my right honourable friend about progress on trying to. Uh, have a hostage transfer because right at the core of mm. this is the visceral feeling which I think anyone can understand of Israelis that they want their people home. Mm -hmm. uh, has, has any progress been made and w would you like to just update the House on, on where point. we are with that? Good question. Well I completely agree with my right honourable and learned friend and, and that is why trying to get the hostages uh, home and out of Gaza and trying to get food in. These are our two twin absolute objectives. And in an extremely difficult circumstance, Britain is certainly right at the front of uh, trying to, of all countries, uh, trying to achieve that. It would not be sensible, Mr. Speaker, for me to give the House a sort of running commentary on hostage release, but he will have seen that negotiations have resumed in Qatar. And obviously, uh, everyone in the House will hope that those negotiations are both speedy and successful. Richard Bergen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> a new independent multi agency investigation by the UN into an Israeli military airstrike on a residential compound housing an emergency medical team, including from Medical Aid for Palestinians, a UK charity, has found it most likely involved and a thousand pound US manufactured bomb fired from an F-16 jet. F-16s include parts supplied by the UK. So will the Minister today rule out conclusively that no parts supplied by the UK were used to bomb a compound housing medical staff from a UK charity? Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the events that the Honourable Gentleman describes are appalling. And what the British government would say is there must be a full and transparent uh, inquiry and examination into how those events took place. Percy. It remains incredible that some people in this place can barely utter a word of criticism of the Hamas regime in Gaza, who themselves are being accused of stealing and hoarding aid. In terms of the operation in Rafa, the Israeli government is very clear that hostages are being held there, that some of those hostages are being subjected to sexual violence and to other abuse. Are we saying to the Israeli government that they have no right to go in to seek to rescue those hostages or not? Minister. No, my, as my honourable friend knows, we have been absolutely clear throughout that Israel has the right of self-defence and what he is describing is covered by the right of self-defence. And my honourable friend sets out eloquently the absolute blame for what has happened, the events on October the 7th perpetrated by Hamas. And once again, he is absolutely right in making that context. Leila Brown. Speaker, we're talking as if famine is imminent. But the fact is that the UN reports 27 Palestinian children have already died from starvation and hunger. Joseph Burrell said that hunger shouldn't be used as a weapon of yes. war, and I would hope the minister would agree with him. Absolutely. We need that ceasefire immediately. We need it to get the hostages out, we need it to get aid in, and we need it to get all the killing to stop. Mm -hmm. My question to the minister is simple. What we're doing isn't working, but there is one more thing we can do, which is to change how we vote at the Security Council. Yeah. 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 Will the UK stop abstaining and join the rest of the world in calling for that immediate ceasefire now. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, she, she speaks on these matters with both great knowledge and great sincerity, and I greatly respect uh, what she says. 
the problem, the problem with calling uh, for an immediate ceasefire is it may solve our consciences, but it is not deliverable because neither side, in this, appall in this appalling brutality, neither side is willing to embrace a ceasefire. And that is why the policy of the British government is to argue in every way we can for a pause so that we can get the hostages out and get aid in, which can then lead to a sustainable ceasefire. And that is what we will continue to do, both, as she says, in all international fora, including at the United Nations. Kit Boltos. Mr Speaker, uh, over the last few months we have all listened to the Minister um, uh, explaining that the Government has been begging, pleading, pressing uh, the Israeli Government to allow more aid in, to seemingly little effect. So now, has he reached the conclusion that the Israeli Government is willfully obstructing the entrance of aid into the Gaza Strip? And if so, that will presumably be a breach of the International Court of Justice's ruling and indeed international humanitarian law. So what will the consequence be of that conclusion? Minister. Well, I don't, I don't agree with his premise, because I don't think we are in a position to reach that uh, judgment. But the point that he is making is that it is essential to get more food and aid and support and medicines into Gaza. And every day the British government is working intensely to that end. Beth Winter. Famine is currently a reality, the highest hunger level of anywhere else in the world in terms of total numbers, all human made, and a ceasefire is a requirement. Those are the words of the UN General Secretary and Matthew Hollingsworth, uh, the Director of the World Food Programme uh, country, and starvation is indeed being used as a weapon of war. Mr Speaker, in Gaza it is clear that Israel is engineering a famine of over two million civilians. And it is also clear UK diplomacy has failed. So the Minister must now indicate what action the Government is going to take to escalate pressure to stop Israel's military assault, demand a ceasefire and ensure that emergency assistance is provided through UNRWA to those being starved to death. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I think many people in Israel and elsewhere will find part of what she said profoundly offensive. And, and the, point, the point I would make to her is that she is right that the, the characteristics of famine are present in Gaza, as I set out in my earlier response. And that is why we are doing everything we can, together with our allies, to get as much food and support into Gaza as we possibly can. Mr Speaker, officials on the ground have stated that Hamas is appropriating or misappropriating as much as 60 per cent of the humanitarian aid that is entering the Gaza Strip. And this is part of a long pattern of prioritising fighters, abusing aid to produce rockets and using construction materials to build hundreds of miles of tunnels for its terror activities. So we know they do it, they've done it for years and they're doing it now. Does my right honourable friend share my concern that Hamas is flagrantly disregarding the humanitarian needs of the people of Gaza whilst Israel has been increasing the amount of aid going in exponentially? Minister. Well, I very much agree with my right honourable and learned friend that Hamas is using ordinary people in Gaza as a human shield. It is utterly repugnant, as well as completely against international humanitarian law. And like him, I condemn it. Lord and Session Lomi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Humanitarian organisations have been warning repeatedly that this would happen. A group of us met with them last week. When this conflict started, I met with Islamic Relief, who are based in my constituency. We have now ended up here, where we are seeing health care being attacked, systematically being degraded. We are seeing no safe zones left. We are told that famine is on the onset, and we are told that the number of people being killed keeps rising. Will the Minister finally please listen to the calls of members across this House, the international communities, the people working on the ground, and call for an immediate ceasefire and unrestricted aid. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I have set out uh, several times already today why calling for an immediate ceasefire may make us feel better, but is not, is not, 
is not is not a is not a practical resolution, and that is why there is no difference between the analysis that she makes and the NGOs in her constituency and mine. There is no difference between the analysis. The question is, what do we do about it? And that is why Britain, along with our allies, is continuously on a 24/7 uh, basis arguing and doing everything practical we can to get more food and support into Gaza. David Jones. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My right honourable friend has mentioned the floating pier to be constructed by the United States. Uh, what uh, assurances has he received that that pier will be used solely for the delivery of humanitarian aid and not, as has been suggested, subsequently repurposed for military use? Minister. Well, I think uh, it, is, it is early days yet to see precisely how that a maritime initiative will deliver. But uh, what he fears, I do not believe, will be allowed to happen in the way in which uh, we, we tackle that issue. And we are giving strong support to all mechanisms for getting aid into Gaza, air, uh, sea and land. But he, like me, will understand that the best mechanism is always by land. Janet Church. Speaker, I don't think I've ever received as many emails of concern from my Edinburgh South West constituents as I have about the situation in Gaza. And as has already been said, over half a million Palestinians are at starvation levels. 27 children and three adults have died so far as a result of starvation and dehydration. And in the words of Medical Aid for Palestine, this is not happening because the rains have failed or because there has been a poor harvest. Mm -hmm. It's happening because the Israeli authorities have refused to allow enough food into Gaza. So I have this question for him, and my Edinburgh South West constituents will be listening to the answer. Does he agree that starvation as a weapon of war is a war crime? Well, the, the, the point which I hope that she will make to her Edinburgh constituents is that she and I, the government, the whole House, is intent on ensuring that more food and more support gets into Gaza as rapidly as uh, possible. And that is uh, what the government is doing every day. Neil O'Brien. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I really welcome the hard work that the Minister is doing to get more aid in, to bring an end to the fighting and to get the hostages uh, released. But it is just appalling to think that large numbers of innocent people, including children, are about to starve when there's aid just over the border. He is right that the aid must flow across the borders. It's better to get it by trucks. But if that's not possible, we must think of this like the Berlin airlift. We've got to get aid in via the sea, via airdrops. I welcome what the Americans are doing to drop it along the shore. We're just going to do whatever it takes to get the aid to the kids who are going to starve unless we do it. Minister. Well, I, I, I completely agree with the sentiments that he expresses uh, so profoundly. And uh, that he is right that every single mechanism must be explored. But he will know that in terms of tonnage, the amount that you can drop from the air, the dangers to those underneath, uh, the dangers of the aid then being misappropriated and stolen by Hamas, these are very real uh, difficulties. And also he will be fully aware about the difficulties of the maritime entry. And that is why we are doing everything we can to argue for more points of entry into Gaza, more trucks to get in there and more different land routes to get the aid which, as he so rightly says, is desperately needed in. Imran Jose. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The ICJ's interim ruling made it absolutely clear the killing of Palestinians in Gaza must stop, but it hasn't. Immediate humanitarian aid must be allowed into Gaza, but it hasn't. And the safety and security of civilians must be guaranteed, but it hasn't. As a result, we are now seeing more than a million Palestinians in Gaza left starving and on the brink of famine, as confirmed by the IPC report today. And the Israeli government continues to flout international law now through the use of starvation as a weapon of war. So I ask the Minister, whilst the children are left starving, civilians are killed and medical facilities attacked, just what will it take for the government to stand with international humanitarian law and oppose the actions of the Israeli military? And how many more innocent Palestinians must be massacred? How many more children must die uh, uh, through starvation? And when will they call for an immediate ceasefire? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I would have hoped that the one thing that was missing from uh, what he said then was an urgent call for the release of the hostages. Uh, and uh, and, and what, what, I, what, I, what I say to him, what I, what I say to him, Mr. Speaker, in, in answer to his question, is that Israel must do more. And we've set out very clearly the five steps that Israel needs to take. They are an immediate humanitarian pause, increased capacity for aid distribution inside Gaza, increased humanitarian access through land and maritime routes, expanding the types of humanitarian assistance allowed into Gaza, such as shelter and items critical for infrastructure repair, and fifthly, a resumption of electricity, water and telecommunications services. Now, I hope that both he and I can unite with everyone else in this House on going after those five key aims. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Israeli hostages must be released. Uh, the uh, innocent Palestinians in Gaza must be supported. Uh, when uh, we... Uh, were the Foreign Affairs Committee were in the Gaza border region just a fortnight ago. We also met with Egyptian President al-Sisi. What particular support uh, can this country provide uh, to the Egyptians in terms of delivering aid and averting a humanitarian refugee crisis that is uh, potentially uh, to occur uh, if uh, the situation isn't stabilised? Well, may I first of all thank my honourable friend and all of the select committee for the work that they have done, the visits they have made and the powerful arguments they have added to those of uh, the government. In, in response to his direct question, uh, I met uh, myself in Egypt with the head of the Egyptian Red Crescent. We are in very close contact and making sure that British aid and British support goes to enhance the excellent efforts which they are doing everything they possibly can themselves to prosecute. Ben Bradshaw. Uh, it, it's clear Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't take the slightest notice yeah. of anything the British government exactly. or even yeah, yeah, yeah. the Americans have been saying. Uh, in uh, mm. 1982, I think it was, Mrs Thatcher suspended arms sales to yeah. Israel. Mm. Uh, in 2002, Tony Blair did the same. What on earth would it take for yeah. this government to follow their example? Yeah. 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 Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, he, 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 he refers um, at the beginning to the views of Prime Minister Netanyahu. He will know that both the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary have engaged directly with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to ensure that he is fully aware of what Britain thinks. And he will also be aware that uh, Israel is a pluralist democracy, the only uh, one in the uh, region. And he will be aware, for example, that uh, Israeli Minister Benny Gantz, who the Foreign Secretary recently met in London, has different views from, uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu. So there, is, there, is, there are many different views, and Britain strongly supports uh, the views that I have set out in the House today. In terms of uh, arms sales and the arms regime, it is not for ministers from the dispatch box to uh, make policy on those things. It is for the proper due processes, as laid down and approved by Parliament, as laid down in the law, to be followed. And that is what we follow. Late drum. Much, Mr. Speaker. Given the impending famine in Gaza outlined by the IPC report, will the UK align with the EU, EU, Sweden, Australia, Canada and many other countries by restoring funding to UNRWA as the most effective way to urgently and immediately scale up delivery of aid, food and medical supplies to Gaza? Minister. Well, I thank um, my honourable friend for her question. As she knows, we are expecting uh, the report from the Office of Internal Oversight Services in the United Nations and, indeed, the interim report from Catherine Corona, the former uh, Foreign Minister of France, uh, tomorrow. And uh, we will read it with very great uh, interest. Uh, Catherine Colonna is working together with the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Sweden, CMI in Norway, and the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And we hope that her report will show a roadmap by which uh, funding to UNRWA by Britain and by many others can be restored. But she will equally be aware 
that UNRWA is fully funded now for some months hence, and that British funding is fully paid up until into the next financial year. Oh, Williams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's estimated that people in northern Gaza have gone entire days and nights without eating at least 10 times in the last 30 days. Uh, Lord Cameron has said that UNRWA was the only body uh, with a distribution network in Gaza. Now, he referred to the report which is available hopefully tomorrow. Will he assure the House that the UK Government will take a decision on resuming funding as soon as possible, at least before the end of this month, which is only 12 days away? Here, here. Minister. Well, I, I cannot give him a precise timetable, but I can answer yes to his question about it being done as soon as we think it is possible to do so. Mark Pritchard. Every life matters, whether Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or indeed other faiths, or uh, no faith. And at the centre of this crisis, a crisis, by the way, that started on the 7th of October, uh, unprovoked attack by Hamas uh, on innocent civilians. But nevertheless, at the mm. centre of this crisis, whatever people's faith or lack of faith, are children and women and men and the vulnerable suffering right now as we go off to our lunch or go off to our afternoon tea or whatever it might be yeah, yeah. and the minister will know that i have been supportive of the government and i will continue to be but i hope he will know to change in tone and that is that there's an estimate of the figures vary of course of thirty thousand civilians being killed in gaza to ten thousand roughly uh, hamas terrorists being killed if it is true that there are 10,000 other terrorists hiding in Rafa, um, despicably amongst the civilian uh, population, making it difficult to deliver aid, but if there are 10,000 there, are we likely to see another 30,000 civilians killed in order that uh, 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 Israel can find those terrorists? And what is the British government's position? Is, is, that, is that something he would support? Well, the, the awful symmetry which he sets out is certainly one which no one wants to see. But the point he makes so eloquently earlier in his question, uh, setting out the views and feelings which he holds, I think are widely reflected across the House, and I agree with him. Thank you. Kim Lepid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With half the population of Gaza at risk of imminent famine, described by Melanie Ward of Medical Aid for Palestinians as meaning starvation, destitution, acute malnutrition and death, does the Minister agree that all available aid corridors must be opened without delay and there must be an immediate ceasefire yeah. to enable food, water and urgent medical supplies to reach over a million people in desperate need? All hostages must be released and this living hell must end. Yeah. Minister. Well, I agree with virtually everything she has said, but she will be aware from what I have said today and on previous occasions that calling for an immediate ceasefire is not, in the opinion of the British Government, a practical proposition. And that is why we continually argue for a humanitarian pause so that we can get the hostages out and food in, followed by a sustainable ceasefire. Sir Britton. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Israeli Prime Minister vowed to press ahead with the assault on Rafa, despite warnings from the international community. The prospect of millions in Rafa, only there anyway to desperately escape from conflict to the north, being subjected to further suffering is intolerable. Can the Minister update the House on what work is going on with our international partners to make clear these concerns to the Israeli Government, whilst continuing to press Hamas? to release the hostages. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to her for her call for the release of the hostages. In, in, in respect of uh, the, uh, any uh, military operations in Rafa, may I draw her attention to the words of the Foreign Secretary and of the Prime Minister about the terrible dangers to, and loss of life and humanitarian consequences of that. And she, like me, uh, and everyone else, I hope, in the House, will be hoping that no such operation goes ahead. Clive Bethan. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. I have no problem condemning Hamas, but equally I have no problem condemning the use of starvation as an act of war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Israel has control on the ground in Gaza, enough to oversee the distribution of aid and to make sure it gets to the people who need it most. So as the <coughs> occupying force, does the government agree that Israel has a legal duty to oversee the distribution of that aid. Yeah, yeah. Minister. 
The, the important point about the distribution of aid is it should be able to get into Gaza, preferably through road and land routes. And I set out for the House earlier the number that are getting in. Although the number is increasing, it's nothing like adequate and doesn't come anywhere near the numbers before October the 7th. And that is why the government is doing everything it possibly can to augment that figure. Steve Double. Thank you, Speaker. We all want to see a ceasefire, a ceasefire that is sustainable and that holds out the prospect of a lasting peace. But the very definition of the word ceasefire means that both sides have to agree to end hostilities. So does my right of a friend agree with me that anyone calling for an immediate ceasefire needs to make absolutely clear that that must include Hamas releasing the hostages, ceasing all hostilities and committing to a future peace? Minister. Well, my, my hon. Friend is, is, is correct in what he says, but the important point which I have repeatedly made in the House is that in order to have a ceasefire, you have to have agreement from those who are taking part in these, these, uh, these actions that they will abide by a ceasefire. Uh, Israel has the right of self-defence and to protect itself from the appalling acts that Hamas perpetrated on October the 7th ever taking place again, and Hamas has made it clear that they wish to repeat those awful acts. So those do not sound to me like a very strong basis for having a ceasefire. Clive Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three standout statements from today. Starvation is being used as a weapon of war. Israel is provoking famine. And the UK is still selling arms to Israel. When will the Secretary of State, when will the Minister understand the damage and the damning nature of this that this is doing to the UK's international reputation, or rather what's left of it? Well, we've been very clear that Israel has the right of self-defence, but that they must abide by international humanitarian uh, law and the rules of war. And, and Britain is one of the leading nations in terms of finding ways to get aid into Gaza and helping our, our allies and other regional powers to do everything we can to get the hostages out. So I hope that he is proud of our country's intervention in both those two respects. Jim Sunderland. Mr Speaker, thank you. I welcome the recent news that the UK will be sending a UK aid field hospital to Gaza. Can I please ask the Minister what assurances have been sought and what assurances have been given in respect of sufficient force protection for all of the staff there, some of whom may be British? Minister. Well, we are acutely conscious, Mr Speaker, about the way in which humanitarian workers, not just in Gaza but all around the world, unarmed put themselves in harm's way for the sake of their fellow human beings. And he is right, a field hospital provided by UK aid, uh, funding to Ahmed, arrived in Gaza from Manchester last uh, Friday. This facility is staffed by uh, UK and by local medics. They will be able to treat over 100 patients a day and we are acutely conscious of the contribution that they are making and we do everything we can to ensure that they are protected. And Mike McDonnell. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, to any reasonable and informed observer, the conduct of the war in Gaza by Israel contravenes basic international humanitarian law in failing to distinguish between armed combatants and civilians and using force beyond what is militarily necessary offence against the prohibition of inflicting unnecessary injury and is wholly disproportionate. Over 100,000 Palestinians have now been killed or injured by Israeli forces in Gaza since last October. So whilst the Minister relies on Israel being a democracy capable of abiding by its legal obligations, when the overwhelming evidence is that it is not doing so, what legal advice has he received about the complicity of and the dangers to our country of failing to take sufficient action under the relevant treaties to which this country is a signatory to deter such gross breaches of international humanitarian law? Well, as I said, um, Mr Speaker, we do continue to assess Israel's commitment and capability to comply with international humanitarian law. Those assessments are supported by a detailed evidence base, conflict analysis, reporting from charities and NGOs, international bodies and 
partner countries, statements and reports by the Israeli government and their track record of compliance. And we take all of that into account in making the judgments we make. But I would point out to him that when it comes to targeting, when it comes to military action, the Israeli Defence Force has its own lawyers embedded in those uh, units and, and uh, in, in much the same uh, way of prudence that the uh, British military do. Uh, that is not something which you see in any other force in the region, and it should give some confidence that they are seeking to abide by international humanitarian law. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, in fact, welcome reports that Israel is opening new routes to directly deliver humanitarian aid into northern Gaza amidst a slowdown in UN operations and the widespread Hamas misappropriation of that aid that was referenced earlier. But significantly, at the same time that that is happening, every single day the IDF is documenting more and more Hamas infrastructure, weapons and missiles within civilian buildings this week at Chief Hospital and last month underneath UNRWA's own headquarters. Yeah. So isn't the reality, the grim reality, that so long as Hamas remains in control of Gaza, no matter how many times people cry for a ceasefire, there Correct. can be no peace. Correct. Minister. Well, it is absolutely clear, as my honourable friend set out, that there is no place for Hamas in any future for uh, Gaza. What happened on October the 7th is uniquely appalling. And I agree with him that until Hamas is removed from Gaza, the opportunity of peace is very limited. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The UN Special Rapporteur has been crystal clear that arms sales to Israel for use in Gaza are unlawful, given the clear risk that they'll be used to violate international humanitarian law. Correct. And yet the government has consistently refused to disclose whether licenses, for example, for F-35 fighter planes, have been reviewed, let alone amended. Yeah. Will he take the opportunity to finally give Parliament a straight answer? I don't want to be told that reviews are possible. We know that. I want to know if those reviews have happened. I want to know if he's going to publish the details of those reviews. And I don't want him to tell us simply that the arms regime in the UK is the toughest in the world. I know that, but that is no reassurance at all to the over one million people who are facing famine in Gaza right now. Minister. Well, she asks me whether these matters, Mr Speaker, are kept under review, and I can assure her that they are always kept under review. But equally, equally, they are not decided at the whims of ministers standing at the dispatch box. They are decided through a detailed, proper, legally governed, code governed process. And that, as always, is what the government is doing. Zara Sultan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we debate this topic, children are starving to death in Gaza. Babies are so malnourished, UNICEF says that they do not have the energy to cry. Famine isn't just imminent, it is happening according to the head of Refugees International. And this isn't a natural disaster, it isn't accidental, it is intentional. Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war to collectively punish the Palestinian people. Israel blocks food from entering Gaza while bombing the people trapped inside. So will the Minister finally admit that officials have warned him that Israel is breaking international humanitarian law, or is his whole department refusing to accept the truth that Israel is committing war crime after war crime in Gaza? Well, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady uses florid language to describe these matters, but I hope that she will, I hope that she will agree with me that the right thing to do is everything we possibly can to get the hostages out and support for the people she so eloquently described, support into Gaza, and that is what the government is seeking to do. And this slaughter. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Every month in Hammersmith we hold Ukrainian Open House to bring together all those supporting Ukrainian families who have fled that war. And every month I'm asked why there are not similar visa schemes mm. to allow Palestinians yeah, yeah, yeah. to join their relatives in the UK I, I or be hosted that. by families who wish to give them refuge here. Yes. What's the government's answer to that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the government's answer, Mr Speaker, is that the two positions are not analogous and are very, very uh, different. But uh, he will know, uh, he, he will indeed know, that we are doing everything we can to help individual cases in both instances, and we will continue to do so. Amy Callaghan. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr Speaker, Save the Children have reported 1.1 million people across Gaza are facing catastrophic food insecurity at the hands of Israel, with one in three children acutely malnourished. Does the Minister agree that Israel's tactic of starving the Palestinian people is a war crime? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. As I have set out uh, several times, Mr Speaker, we are doing everything we can to make sure that the necessary food and resources get into Gaza, so that the point which the, the point which Save the Children made in the evidence which she uh, read out is addressed, and we will continue to do precisely that. Sam Turry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister will know that the UK supplies approximately 15% of the components using F-35 stealth bombers currently being deployed in Gaza. The very same bomber that's allegedly, in recent news, uh, being deployed from RAF Akatori in Cyprus. Now, earlier this month, Mr. Speaker, a Dutch court ordered the country's government to block all exports of F-35 jets parts to Israel over concerns they have been used to violate international law during the ongoing war in Gaza. So I want to know, Mr. Speaker, whether the minister will commit today to suspending its supply of F-35 components, and will he also confirm whether the RAF bases are actually being used as a launch pad for bombing in Gaza, or indeed any supportive operations, military, of the IDF and Israeli military forces? Well, I, I repeat, uh, Mr. Speaker, that these are decisions that are not made at the whim of a minister standing at the dispatch box. They are made in the normal way through a proper legal and coded practice, and the government will always operate on that basis in these situations. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, Canada, Australia, Sweden, the EU have now confirmed that they will restore the funding to UNRWA refuting Israel's accusation that 450 members of the agency staff had participated in the 7th October attack. With people dying from the imminent famine in Gaza, with Palestinians being killed trying to get flour to feed their families, the international community holds a degree of responsibility for failing to stop this. In light of the catastrophe situation in Gaza, Will the minister commit to restarting and increasing its funding to UNRWA as a matter of urgency? Well, Mr Speaker, we have already increased funding significantly, including to UNRWA. He will know that Britain uh, is not, uh, at the moment, uh, in a position of having to make that decision because we have fully funded what we said we would do and are not due to provide any further money till the end of April. But the answer to his question, I hope, will be contained in the report, both from the Office of International Oversight Services, but also from the Katyn Colonna report, which we interim report, which we are expecting tomorrow. And I know that he, like me, will read it with great care in the hope that it shows a suitable way ahead, which we can all endorse. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister uh, try and help the House and? Uh, uh, and understanding the government's position and who the government believes is directly responsible for blocking the aid going into Gaza? And can he also tell us what the government's direct response is to the comments of the UN General Secretary, who has said that this is the highest number of people facing catastrophic hunger ever recorded by the integrated food security system anywhere and at any time? Minister. Well, regardless of the accuracy of those final comments, there is no doubt at all, as I set out in my early responses, that the IPCC report says, and I quote again, famine is a very real scenario. And that is why we are trying to do everything we can to ensure that aid gets into Gaza by every possible means. I have explained to the House the difficulties of the air option and the maritime option, but those difficulties are not stopping us from pursuing those opportunities. But at the end of the day, it is by agreement with Israel getting more trucks in, uh, by opening up uh, more points of entry, by finding other ways of bringing aid in by road. We are pursuing all of those matters, and we will continue to do so. Sarah Owen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The need for an arms embargo in Israel was laid out by the International Court of Justice in January due to genocidal risk and serious harms to civilians. Since then, we've had no action from ministers. UN experts have rightly called for hostage exchange and release, but they've also warned the transfer of weapons or ammunition to Israel should cease immediately. Over 13,000 children killed, the destruction of 60% of civilian homes, and hospitals destroyed. Water and food supplies so low, Gaza is already in the midst of a catastrophic, man-made, state-made famine. Mr Speaker, 
The Minister boasted moments ago that the UK has an arms licensing framework with some of the toughest regulations in the world. It is plain to see for everyone that claim is in tatters. So when will the ministers finally match their words with action and hold the Israeli government to these standards and hear the calls from aid agencies, the UN and my constituents to stop arms sales to Israel and to stop the onslaught against innocent Palestinian men, women and children? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, um, as I have repeatedly said to the House, the issue of arms sales is dealt with in a uh, legal and a coded way, and the government has no intention of varying from uh, that uh, process. Uh, it has been shown that, as I said before, it is the toughest uh, regulatory regime in the world. Uh, we continually keep it under review, but it is important that these things are done properly and in accordance with uh, the rules laid down by Parliament and laid down by the law, and we will not vary that. In, in respect of the early part of her question, I agree with her that it is essential that we are able to get more supplies into uh, Gaza. Uh, we spend all our time arguing for new ways of entry, for new opportunities to get aid in. And as I set out in the five key aims that we have, we want to see a resumption of electricity, water and telecommunication services, as well as infrastructure repair, start as soon as possible. John MacDonald. And we're all across the House, we're all desperate to see the release of the hostages. But the negotiations with regard to the release of the hostages is not aided by the treatment of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails and detention centres. The Israeli newspaper Haratz has reported that 27 Palestinian detainees have died since the war was gone, who've been in Israeli custody, and some during direct questioning. They've reported beatings, abuse, torture, sexual assault. Prisoners being prevented access to doctors and lawyers and refused access to medication. <coughs> um, a magistrate in Jerusalem has reported that the prisoners are detained in cages which are unfit for human beings. And now we've had the family of Marwan Barghouti, the Palestinian leader, who many place hopes in in securing peace, have been beaten by, with clubs by guards. Could I ask the minister to demand of the Israeli government now that there is access to the detention centres and prisons for humanitarian bodies to investigate these abuses and bring forward a report which will hopefully will end the abuse and assist in the negotiations for the release of the hostages. Minister. Well, the Right Honourable Gentleman has uh, put his finger specifically on the treatment of detainees. As he will be aware, the treatment of detainees is governed by international humanitarian uh, law and indeed by the Geneva Convention. Uh, he will have seen what the Foreign Secretary has said about the treatment of detainees, and Britain has consistently called for uh, both an inquiry and transparency in respect to that inquiry for any alleged abuses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has laid great weight this afternoon on the legal and coded process which governs the export of arms. But in his department now has been created a new centre, the International Humanitarian Law Compliance Assessment Process Cell. Will he now publish every assessment that that cell has made of Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law? And will he tell the House now whether the threshold has now been reached to either review or cancel any extant open general export licence for arms sales? Minister. Well, the, the Right Honourable Gentleman has served at a senior level in government, and he, he knows what governments publish and what they don't publish. But what he can rest assured is that when we receive advice on international humanitarian law. Uh, we look at it uh, extremely carefully, and when the law officers make their judgments, we come to the House and update the House on this matter, and that is what we will do in due course. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of us in this place have been calling since November for the release of the hostages, the removal of Hamas, an immediate bilateral ceasefire, and humanitarian aid. Sometimes it seems the only thing that's changed is that the situation has got worse yes. for the people in Gaza. My constituents write to me constantly 
they feel that the Israeli government is ignoring pleas and that the people of Palestine have been abandoned. The minister said earlier that he would do whatever it took in the situation. I have every respect for the minister and I believe him when he says that. So does he accept that one of the biggest barriers to peace is, is, is illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank? Just recently, there were sanctions against four Israeli settlers who have committed human rights abuses against Palestinians. But the Liberal Democrats would hope that this is just the start. So will the UK government consider sanctioning ministers Ben Gavir and Smotrich, yeah. who promote this extremist agenda and all of the settler movements connected to them yeah. in a way to finally make a difference to what is happening? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, the, the Honourable Lady will be aware that Britain has consistently condemned settler violence. We've made it clear that we expect those responsible to be caught and arrested and tried um, and uh, punished for that, and we will continue to do so. As she mentioned, there are four uh, settlers specifically who have been sanctioned. We don't discuss across the House the operations of the sanctions regime, but she may rest assured that the opinion of the government is that these settlements are illegal, these acts which she described are illegal, and we will do everything we can to ensure that they stop. Holly Lynch. Thank you very much. As MPs right across this House have said this afternoon, children in Gaza are starving. They are being starved, and we cannot tolerate it. If the UK is standing on the rules-based order and international humanitarian law is to be worth anything around the world, then the ICJ ruling has to be binding and there has to be consequences for failure to comply. What are the consequences? When she says that people are starving in Gaza, that's, everyone agrees that that is the case. The issue is what we can constructively do to bring about an end to the very worrying starvation figures which have been revealed uh, this week. And we are doing everything we possibly can, and we will continue uh, to do so. And I've set out at some length in the House the various different ways in which we are trying to achieve that. Uh, Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. I want to follow on from my honourable friend's question because I think it is at the heart of where we are now. Look, my constituents are heartbroken at the images that they are being sent from Gaza of children uh, dying of hunger. And they want to know why the world is largely doing nothing to help them. I believe in the rules-based system, which is under enormous strain right now from a variety of different quarters. But international law matters, and we have to show leadership when it comes to the rulings of international institutions like the ICJ. Yeah. So what is Britain doing to make sure that Israel and other parties hold to the international law, the rule of law and the judgments of the ICJ? Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, he, he, he says that... Uh, um, his constituents are heartbroken by what is happening, and we are all of us heartbroken by what is happening. The issue is, what do we do about it? And I have set out throughout the course of the last hour a number of ways in which Britain is showing real leadership in trying to address the humanitarian situation, in trying to make sure that negotiations are successful for getting the hostages out. And we will continue to bend every sinew along with our allies to ensure that everything that can be done is done. Deirdre Brock. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, he, the Minister spoke of the detailed evidence base his government uh, re is relying on, but the world's media are prevented from reporting inside yeah. Gaza almost entirely. And if we'd seen the daily reality of life there in more detail, I suspect the international pressure on Israel would have been even stronger. But what is the UK government to ensure that, doing to ensure any deliberate targeting of journalists, particularly the Palestinian journalists, protected, of course, under international humanitarian law, is being passed on to the ICC for their investigation into war crimes? Well, as I set out, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the uh, issue of targeting 
uh, unusually in both uh, Israel, in the IDF, and indeed in the British military, is governed by legal advice. Lawyers are embedded in the people who are, with the people who are making these uh, decisions. And in respect of the uh, media, any such targeting would be absolutely outrageous. And uh, I pay tribute to the brave uh, journalists who are ensuring that accurate reporting comes back uh, from uh, Gaza and from the Middle East. Khalid Mahmoud. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I want to make clear that Hamas have opposed since 2007. I deplore the action taken on the 7th of October. I totally believe the hostages on both sides must be released. But I agree with him in terms of the Israeli blockade that is leading to famine, that is leading to death and displacement, young children dying of malnutrition and hunger. He says continuously that the two sides want it done together. Why doesn't it then put a Security Council resolution to the United Nations making sure that something is done about it on an international level and put in a key peacekeeping force to deal with this issue and allow the people to continue normal lives. Well, I think, I think the House will understand, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the issue of a, a policing force inside Gaza is, uh, is premature. Uh, I thank him for his uh, comments uh, about uh, Hamas. Uh, and for what he has said about deploring all the things that Hamas uh, have done, and I agree with him about that. He sets out the scale of humanitarian need, and throughout all of the statement, I've been setting out how Britain, along with our allies, is seeking to help move the dial to get more aid and support into Gaza and get the hostages out. In terms of the United Nations Security Council and its resolutions. He will know that Britain is one of the leading architects of those resolutions in our role as one of the permanent five in uh, New York. And I can tell him uh, that that effort, and I pay tribute uh, to uh, Barbara Woodward, uh, the permanent representative of Britain at the United Nations, they are working ceaselessly in the British mission at the UN to try and make sure that there is agreement on resolutions which can help bring an end to this. Chris Law. Madam Deputy Speaker, the famine unfolding is entirely man-made and is being used as a weapon of war by Israel, a war crime, and those that continue to support this collective punishment and deny aid are complicit in this unfolding tragedy. Last week, Yanez Lenarsik, the head of humanitarian aid and crisis management at the European Commission, said that neither he nor any other UNRWA donor had been presented with any evidence <coughs> by Israel of UNRWA involvement in the 7th of October attacks. Indeed, our own committee, when it visited northern uh, Egypt just recently, spoke to the head UNRWA. They also had no evidence. So, very simple question. Has the minister been presented with any evidence to support his decision to pause the UK's life or death funding to UNRWA? Yeah. Yeah. Well, minister? Madam Deputy Speaker, he will have seen the evidence that has been put before the international community. He will know that it was sufficiently strong for he will know that it was sufficiently strong for the head of UNRWA immediately to act against some of his officials. But on uh, all these matters, uh, tomorrow we will hear the interim report from Catherine Colonna, the uh, former uh, French uh, Foreign Minister, and we look forward to studying that report in the hope that it will take matters uh, forward when we have a chance to read it. Uh, Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State will be aware that thousands across Israel have protested opposing yeah. the approach that President Netanyahu is taking, including the hostage families. They know the situation in Gaza will not help release their family members. Yeah that people in Israel see what is happening to the Palestinians. They hear the words today of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, Volker Turk, who has said that what is happening and Israel continuing restrictions on aid could amount to the use of starvation as a method of war. He is explicit about that and the concerns that it raises. I understand the minister telling us that he doesn't want to make policy from the dispatch box. Will he tell us whether he has sought explicit legal advice on this question about whether Israel is now committing a war crime in the use of starvation? Yes or no? 
So the, the issue of legal advice, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is one that we are always in receipt of and we act upon it and uh, when we receive it, we take the necessary steps as she would expect. In the first part of her question, she set out a point that I was making earlier, that Israel, uh, more eloquently than me, but that Israel is a pluralist democracy. There are different views. And I tweeted last weekend the extraordinary moving work being done by two people who had come together from opposite sides, whose families had suffered so grievously in the aftermath of October the 7th. It is that pluralist democracy which gives us the chance that accountability will be properly followed in Israel, which, as I say, is the only uh, pluralist democracy that we see in that part of the world. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The IPC report published today shows that one in three children under two years old in the north of Gaza are now acutely malnourished. This figure was one in six in February. Uh, this month, people of Muslim faith across the world will be observing Ramadan. Uh, the situation is, is, is dire and urgent in, in Gaza, so will the government, uh, will the minister call for an immediate ceasefire to ensure that no civilian goes hungry, malnourished or without medical support in Gaza? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, he and I both share absolutely the desire that people should not go hungry in Gaza, and that is why the government, along with our allies, is working so hard to get uh, more food uh, in. And we will continue to do everything we possibly can to make sure that the suffering, uh, which has been so eloquently set out on all sides of this House, uh, is brought to an end as soon as possible. Alison Foulis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Does there would be, I think, a uh, very serious doubt about the term deliberate uh, starvation, the deliberate starvation. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm unable to give her a yes or no answer to her question. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We all know that behind Hamas sits the malign power of Iran and the IRGC. The same with Hezbollah and also with the Houthis. So with the Foreign Secretary now having been in post for five months, can the Minister update the House on the progress of actually prescribing the IRGC? Well, as, as she will know, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the issue of prescription is not one which we discuss across the floor of the House, but the arguments for and against are kept under very close review uh, by the Government and will continue to be kept under that review. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. To deal with the worsening grave humanitarian crisis for the sake of the dying children and innocent civilians, as Palestinians desperately try to survive and observe the holy month of Ramadan, it is imperative that both sides agree to an immediate ceasefire, which is what I recently voted for in Parliament. Aid in huge quantities is critical, and any attempts by the Israeli government to block it must be condemned. So, Minister, what is the UK government doing to achieve an immediate ceasefire, get hostages released, and put pressure on the Israeli government to allow unimpeded aid into Gaza? Well, he will have seen the words of the Prime Minister and of the Foreign Secretary about the absolute imperative of getting more aid and humanitarian supplies uh, into uh, Gaza. And uh, what he says about an immediate ceasefire, I've um, answered that point on a number of occasions uh, during the last uh, hour and a quarter. Uh, as he knows, in order to get a ceasefire, both sides in this terrible conflict need to agree for a ceasefire. And there is absolutely no indication whatsoever that Hamas have any intention of a ceasefire. Indeed, they have made absolutely clear that they wish to perpetrate once again the terrible events that took place on October the 7th. Uh, Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Hamas's cold-blooded murder of at least 1,300 Israeli civilians on the 7th of October was truly abhorrent. But now, sadly, those horrific numbers are dwarfed by the number of innocents of all faiths who've had their lives taken away from them in Gaza. I welcome the fact that the government's moving on this position, but I believe it's going to have to move further and faster to pre prevent a catastrophe and further loss of innocent lives. The Minister has stated that the International Court of Justice ruling is binding. Will he inform the House how that ruling can be enforced? Well, the, the point he makes about the government uh, moving on its policy 
is, is, uh, is not true. Basically, the government has made it clear throughout that we will do everything we possibly can to achieve a pause so that we can help get the hostages out and food and support into uh, Gaza. And we are continuing to do everything we can, night and day, to reach that conclusion. Ms. Morden. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. The head of the UN, Antonio Guterres, and the head of the EU policy, Joseph Borrell, and multiple accounts on the BBC have all indicated famine is underway.